So, yeah, I like you to welcome to the second talk of our colloquium. Today we have Andrew Lamstein, and he will give a talk about scalable second order methods for machine learning and AI. But before we listen to his talk, we have a second speaker today. Let me introduce you, Dr. Samuel J. Bantley. He serves at LSU Vice President and is the Billy and Ann Harrison Chair in Sedimentary Geology. He got his PhD in Coastal Geology, Oceanography from Sunny Stone Brook in 1989. And his current research involves field laboratory and modeling studies of sediments and stratigraphy on continental margins of ocean basins, including the Mississippi Delta. We are very grateful that you didn't want to miss the opportunity today to say a couple of words as an opening statement to our second seminar in the series of the Cairo Colloquium for Artif Artificial Intelligence Research and Optimization. So welcome, Sam. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, it's, a, it's a great honor to offer uh, introductory comments today uh, preceding uh, Dr. Lumsdane's uh, talk and also in the second talk of the uh, Cairo Colloquium series. The, I'd like to thank uh, Hartman uh, and the, uh, the program committee, including Patrick and Katie Bailey and, um, and all the others who've been involved in, the, uh, in bringing this up to, up to speed. And it, this is a very exciting time for us. And so just, I just wanna set, uh, put, put this in sort of the context that I see the work that you all are doing. So I think we can all recognize that uh, AI and machine learning and the various other related tools that you know so much more about than I do uh, really pervade many aspects of our life today, whether we know about them or not. And the same is true for research on the LSU campus. Uh, I mean, I've, I don't think I've been in one proposal defense or read one dissertation in the last couple of years, um, even in coastal geosciences that doesn't include some aspect of, uh, of artificial intelligence or machine learning or deep learning or some, some approach like this that to, uh, to sort of enhance the, um, uh, the research. So it's, it's been a very exciting time. And so there, there are many research labs, not only in coastal geology, but across LSU who uh, are, uh, work, are using these approaches. And it's, it's really, really cool. There have been some uh, great successes and some great opportunities that we're trying to go after. I mean, the, um, uh, the, the, the Cairo proposal that Hartmut led back in the fall, I mean, we all know how, how much heart, how, how much work goes into developing a major proposal. And we also know that even if a proposal of that scale is not successful the first time, the work that goes into it is not lost. And so it's, it's a great effort to bring the team together at LSU. We've also uh, had success in other, other sectors of campus. Our deep drug team led by Supertech Mokopadier and Michael Berlinski has done great work on drug discovery, first for uh, drug resistant bacteria and most recently working on, uh, on developing drugs for the treatment of uh, the COVID virus. Even in, even in academic programs, this is, uh, this is becoming much more front and center. But I'll just give you a quick story on that. About two weeks ago, uh, I received a, a note from uh, the provost, my boss, uh, saying, it, it, with a short statement from the University of Florida outlining uh, their... Uh-oh. All right, how about that? Okay, you are back, perfect. Yes, <laughs> gone from uh, our, our, uh, our power just went out, so I'm on my cell phone. Um, should, get, should I uh, wrap up rather quickly? Yes, so we can start the tour, of course. We're right. Be a little bit late. Yeah, that's fine. Well, so all I wanted to wrap up with is that, uh, is that uh, University of Florida and LSU and many other universities are really looking, uh, looking for ways to capitalize on the power of machine learning and AI. And, uh, and, and I'm really excited that, uh, that we've got this opportunity not only to, to, to tackle the, um, 
using it more broadly across our campus, but actually make it a more powerful tool. So I'd like to thank Dr. Lumsdane for his uh, for joining us today uh, under however crazy and chaotic circumstances, and uh, and thanks CCT uh, and the whole uh, uh, the whole production team for putting this together. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your welcome remarks. And before we start with Andrew's turn, I would like to introduce him to you. So Andrew Lamstein is an internationally recognized expert in the area of high performance computing, who has made important contributions in many of the constitutive areas of HPC, including systems, programming languages, software libraries, and performance modeling. He works in HPC has been motivated by data-driven problems, for example, large-scale graphs analytics, as well as more traditionally computational science problems. He has been active participant in multiple standardization efforts, including the MPI forum, C++ technical forum, the ISO C++ standardization committee, the One API technology advisory board, and the CISL advisory panel, open source software project, Resulting from his work includes the Matrix Template Library, the Boost Craft Library, and Open MPI. So thanks, Andrew, for giving the talk, and the stage is yours. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Patrick, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, uh, CCT, for the um, invitation and opportunity to uh, uh, present. Um, I'll start with just a maybe a, a quick story from uh, my own life. So neural networks and machine learning and AI is nothing new, right? I mean, the um, for in AI, everyone's heard of the Turing test. And uh, that goes back to really the, the very first days of things we think of as being computer science with, with Alan Turing. And so even from the, from the very beginning of uh, computing, people were thinking about um, how how to use these things in, to replace, you know, very high-level uh, capabilities of of, um, of humans. Really, re replacing, uh, you know, creating, if you like, thinking uh, machines. And so, when I and and there have been, you know, periodic uh, waves of interest um, that kind of um, ebbed and flowed over the years. One of the um, peaks was when I. In, in the past was just when I was starting my own graduate program. And at the time, um, you know, my advisor made the kind of offhand comment that neural networks seemed to always be the second best solution to every, every problem. And that's changed uh, recently. And of course, I mean, some of the things we see uh, machine learning doing is just um, astonishing, actually. We're really starting to approach the levels of a sufficiently advanced technology. And so um, if we think about what enabled that, though, that was really the um, emergence of, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll just point and, and just say it, that it was really just the emergence of GPUs um, as a particular type of compute resource that was so well matched to the, the needs of uh, neural networks or, or deep neural networks that we were able to suddenly take advantage of what was really possible with these uh, types of systems. But there's still uh, limitations uh, despite that. And what I wanna to try to talk about today is really how, how we can maybe make another similar kind of leap. So in with the emergence of TPUs, we have this um, phase change, if you like, or quantum leap from uh, neural networks being the second best solution to all problems to really being the, the best solution by far. I mean, if you look in the, um, uh, particularly in the computer vision uh, community, uh, machine learning has completely dominated all approaches for uh, solving typical computer vision problems. And so my uh, hypothesis right now is that um, by uh, now scaling machines and systems out by taking advantage of large scale parallel 
quantism and supercomputers, we can achieve another sort of quantum leap in um, the capabilities of, of these systems. And the drop, the, the limitation right now in what we can do with um, deep learning and, and deep neural networks is really based on how long it takes to train these uh, systems. And the training time then constrains uh, the, uh, the turnaround time for doing experiments and doing research and, and, and creating new uh, types of systems. And so the problem we run into, and we'll look at this in more, more detail during the talk, is that um, because of the inherent nature of some of the current approaches for doing training, we can't just throw more hardware. We can't just parallelize them in the way we'd like to, uh, to be able to speed things up and to scale out. And our, what we're proposing and, and what this talk is about is how we can use um, higher order methods and particularly second order methods that um, can first of all, give us better convergence so that we can um, you know, get to a solution in, in a fewer number of steps, but also um, enable uh, more ready parallelization so that we can make those fewer steps also in a shorter amount of time. And, and that's true even though in, in terms of total amount of computation, the cost uh, per step or per iteration might be higher with these second order methods. So the, the ultimate goal, I guess, of, of what we're trying to do um, with Cairo, the, the project, is to reduce the training time in um, uh, deep learning from weeks to hours or even minutes and really achieve this next kind of phase change and quantum leap in capabilities of uh, machine learning similar to what happened when uh, GPUs arrived on the scene. And so what I want to kind of cover in the talk is, uh, first of all, motivate the uh, second order methods by looking at uh, machine learning training as an optimization problem. Uh, just quickly talk about some of the first order methods, particularly stochastic gradient descent, and then spend the bulk of the talk uh, covering uh, different classes of second order methods, and then finally present some uh, experimental results that we have with the um, MNIST uh, data set. So neural network training. Um, this is just a quick uh, overview again with, and introduce some of the notation we'll be seeing. So one way of thinking about what the, the neural net does is it's just basically a nonlinear function of um, some input x, uh, x sub zero, and some output it'll produce um, x sub l. So x zero is the input, x l is the output, uh, the nonlinear function is n, and it depends on these parameters theta. And the whole game in training is trying to find the, the best possible settings for those parameters so that we uh, get the neural network to do what we want it to do. And typically, we characterize that um, task in terms of a loss function. So in, for instance, in a, in a supervised learning situation, we might just compare the um, output of the network against some ground truth. Um, and then create an objective function for overall training, which might be the sum of the losses over all of the um, inputs, where we compare, um, again, the output of the neural net function um, or the loss of the output of the neural net function with the ground truth uh, that, that we have for that known input. And so our training goal is to find this very best set of parameters to make that objective function as small as possible. And so the approach that's typically used is uh, we have a, a going to iterate uh, and compute successive values of um, this, these parameters theta. So theta of k plus one will be the previous value of theta plus some update. And the two pieces um, involved in making that update are first of all finding uh, the direction p that will um, maximize or decrease in our objective function. So our goal is to make our, as, as we 
take steps, we want to make the objective function smaller and smaller. So we want to take a step in a direction that will maximize the decrease in, in J. And that turns out to be in the direction of the derivative or in the opposite direction of the derivative, which is the um, transpose of the gradient. So um, sometimes the derivative and cost function <clears throat> derivative of the cost function and gradient of the cost function are used somewhat interchangeably. They're essentially the same, except one, one is the, the transpose of, of the other. I'll typically talk about the derivative rather than gradient, but often in the machine learning literature, people talk about the, the gradient. So the uh, steepest descent approach then that we can use is uh, just based on picking our step sizes in the direction of the gradient uh, P or the transpose of the derivative and um, updating our uh, parameters uh, accordingly. So in this formulation, um, we're uh, computing this gradient using the entire training set. Uh, that doesn't always uh, work. Um, In, in terms of the rate of convergence and so forth. And, and we'll talk about that uh, in, in a little more detail. So another approach, and, and this is where we really get to the stochastic gradient descent, is that rather than forming a gradient based on the entire training set, we'll just take one element at a time from the training set, um, compute the um, gradient based on that, and then take a step, uh, update the parameters based on that one element. And we can uh, go in between all the elements or just one element uh, and use mini batches. But the idea is that we, in stochastic gradient descent, as we, in some sense, do update um, incrementally for each member of uh, the training set. So the entire stochastic gradient descent back propagation algorithm looks like this. And um, what I want to try to get across here, maybe is not so much that everyone memorized this for the, the test that's coming up at the end of the talk, but rather um, try to motivate where some of the parallelization might be. So there are two uh, kind of primary steps in uh, computing the gradient. Um, so this is typically done with a technique known as back propagation. So first we feed the signal forward through the network. Um, so for each stage in the network, we compute the x values um, in, in successive stages from x0 to xl. And then we go backwards, computing gradients and updating the parameters as we go. This turns out to be a very sequential uh, process. So we can see we have three nested loops and they seem to all depend on each other. If we look a little more, carefully at the loops. I mean, so the outer loop is the iteration count that we're doing. We can't really, you know, do those simultaneously. And similarly, on the inner loop, we're feeding the um, signal forward through the network and then feeding it backwards. We can't really uh, do any of that in parallel. That's inherently sequential. With the um, batches though, as I said, there's in between doing one sample at a time and doing all the samples at a time to compute gradient, we can do uh, some finite number of them, some subset of them. And this is sometimes called mini using mini batches. And in that case, we can get some parallelism because we can do each of the members of the mini batch in parallel. But unfortunately, it turns out, and um, this is just borne out empirically, as we increase the size of the mini batches, so as we increase the size of the mini batches, we increase the amount of potential parallelism. But as we increase the size of the mini batches, we, it also, at least for stochastic gradient descent, uh, this won't be true for the second order methods, but for stochastic gradient descent, increasing the mini batch size actually slows uh, the convergence of, of the algorithm. So there's limitations there. Um, we also have some potential parallelism. And we'll look at this in, in the next slide in a little more detail um, at the lower level in, in terms of doing these low level computations. But in some sense, that's been 
uh, well uh, optimized by the GPUs. I mean, this is the, in the feed forward and the back propagation steps, uh, getting the maximal performance there has been where the, the GPUs have really made the contributions. And so again, what we're trying to do is add another dimension of parallelizability and scalability. And really the place we'll be attacking this primarily is in parallelizing across the, the batches. And we can think of this or look at this graphically. So if we have um, a problem, and this is just shown <laughs> very stylistically, I uh, drew this myself. Um, so uh, I, I hope it makes sense to other people, but given uh, some training set input with a, a batch size B, what, uh, again, the, the kind of parallelism we're proposing is that we can split the batch into uh, different pieces and uh, do those in parallel uh, with copies of the, the model on different machines. The other types of parallelism uh, I mentioned, so for instance, with the model parallelism, we can do different parts of the model on different nodes or on different processors. But again, for the model parallelism and pipelining parallelism, that's really optimizations done on a single node and has been very well accomplished by um, using GPUs. So second order methods, what are they? The idea is that rather than just trying to maximize how much smaller we can make the cost function, let's go ahead and actually find the minimizer of it. So the, the gradient descent approach, we're trying to compute an update so that at each step, we're gonna make the cost function smaller. With the second order method, we want to make the, we actually want to find the minimum of um, the cost function. And so from calculus, as we know that um, we find the minimum or maximum of different functions where the derivative is equal to zero. So our task now, or one way of phrasing second order methods is we want to uh, develop methods where we have um, a solution that will drive the uh, derivative or the gradient of the objective function to zero. And so this, the derivative is a, a nonlinear function of n, n variables and n unknowns. The kind of classic uh, approach to solving problems like that is uh, Newton's method. And so um, I'll be writing uh, F as, as we uh, go through some of the rest of the slides rather than dj, but realize that f is what the function we're trying to minimize or, or trying to drive to zero. Um, and that that's actually equal to the derivative of the cost function. And what Newton's method does is it uses a linear approximation uh, based on a Taylor expansion uh, around um, the current set point to uh, compute a uh, uh, update of the of, of the state. So we uh, basically invert this uh, derivative of the derivative of the, of the cost function and uh, use that to compute our, our increment. So this step on line four, where we compute D equal to um, the inverse of the derivative of the derivative of the cost function. And we'll refer to that as the Hessian. Um, when we invert that um, or solve the linear system really, uh, for D sub K, um, that's our, our update step now with uh, the, the second order methods. And one um, appeal of this method is there's no actual limit on the batch size, then we can do uh, ap apply this with a, a full batch and have maximum parallelism um, in that case. Unfortunately, so we think about things in terms of uh, dimensions of things. So I mentioned that the um, nonlinear function f, the derivative of the cost function is a function of um, n variables and it produces n variables as a result. It maps rn to rn. 
then the Hessian is going to be a matrix that is n by n. So if, you know, just a, a modest sized uh, network these days might have a few million uh, parameters, that means we would have a, a matrix that's a million by a million or a few million by a few million. And that, you know, 10 to the 12th entries uh, is more uh, space than is, uh, you know, we can reasonably store even on a supercomputer and is more uh, running through it, iterating through it is more work than we'd want to do. So we uh, might not actually want to form that. And so we'll be looking at, at ways of um, uh, approximating uh, the Hessian. Um, in fact, an, another reason to think about uh, approximating the Hessian is if you actually write it out, it's uh, very complicated. Um, it's very large scale uh, entity and is very expensive to uh, compute and store. So the thing to remember, even though in the rest of the talk, we'll be looking at second order methods, second order methods are based on using the Hessian. All of these approaches are going to use the Hessian without using the Hessian. So kind of remember this picture from this uh, classic uh, movie um, there is no Hessian, even though we'll be talking about using the Hessian. And it, we'll see what we mean by that in, in a minute. So the, the real formulation of the Newton iteration that we're going to use is the inexact Newton method. And the idea there is rather than um, in, in the step of computing our update where we solve a linear system, we are going to just produce an approximation to the linear system solution. And that could be by using an approximate solver or using an approximate solver with an approximate matrix or using an exact solver with an approximate matrix or so on. But the idea is that we produce a solution that just approximately the, the correct solution. And that's fine, right? I mean, we're not we're in an iteration anyway of trying to approach the uh, best value of theta. So if our update isn't exactly the best, you know, we're gonna keep iterating anyway. And under some suitable conditions we, for how the accuracy or, or how these approximations go, we can still get the desired kinds of convergence that we would want from uh, second order methods. So the, the first um, inexact Newton method we want to look at is based on uh, using a Krylov solver for solving the linear system solution. So these are the class of methods, uh, for instance, that conjugate gradient um, is the, the canonical exemplar. And this is a, a, a related algorithm to conjugate gradient, uh, conjugate residual. And again, the uh, <laughs> you know, the, the whole algorithm's here, the, uh, this, this won't be on the quiz. The point is that within these algorithms, there's an important step, and that is uh, computing the uh, matrix by vector product. So if you look in a textbook on conjugate gradient or conjugate residual, um, within there, there's a, a step of computing A times X. Well, in, in our case, that A, the matrix that we're trying to invert is the Hessian, or it's the derivative of this uh, nonlinear function F. Well, we can take advantage of that to compute the approximate uh, result of applying that matrix to a vector. And we can do that by, again, relying on um, Taylor series and uh, computing uh, the, the value of the function f at theta naught plus some small perturbation in the direction of the vector we're interested in multiplying by and then subtracting off the um, original f of theta naught. And that's in, in step 10. And so the idea is that we can approximate our um, application of a matrix or a approximating this key operation inside of the Krylov solver of a matrix times vector product by um, just using our nonlinear function application. So that's, in, in this case, that's how there is no Hessian, right? We're just using the um, nonlinear uh, function, which as a reminder is the 
gradient or the derivative of the cost function, which is something the um, different frameworks like PyTorch or LibTorch are optimized to compute for you. So um, this, as, as we'll see when we, at, at the very end, when we talk a little bit about implementation, um, this fits nicely in, into the, the way these frameworks are already uh, built. Now, the second class of um, second order methods are, um, instead of inexact Newton, these are sometimes called quasi-Newton or uh, secant methods. And the idea here, um, we can kind of motivate from the one dimensional case. The idea with um, Newton's method is we're approximating our function that we're trying to solve by um, linearizing it at a certain point and assuming that that linearization will take us to the um, exact solution. It doesn't, but then, you know, we, so we keep applying that linearization process until we converge to the exact solution. Well, if that um, derivative isn't available for some reason, we can approximate the derivative, right? By taking a chord um, across the nonlinear function. So we can evaluate the nonlinear function at two points take the difference between those two points, take um, the difference between the function evaluated at those two points, divide them. That gives us the slope, which is an approximation to the tangent line, right? And that gives us, um, we can then use that as an approximate value for uh, the Newton solver. Now, the problem is, we can't quite, in the case of vector multidimensional quantities here, we can't quite um, do that division to get the slope of the line. What we do instead is we um, set up a, what we call the secant conditions. So in the direct case, we um, are looking for a matrix B, B sub K that uh, satisfies the secant condition. So that B times the delta X is equal to the, the deltas in F. And we can flip that around as well. So there's a dual condition. So we can think about rather than um, trying to find this B, we could find the inverse of B, or we'll, we'll call that H here, so that it satisfies this uh, condition that delta X is equal to H times the, the deltas in F. And so we can uh, basically write out our um, Newton methods or quasi-Newton methods with these uh, secant uh, matrices. So in the case of the direct method, we have a step where we solve a linear system based on B. In the, what's interesting in the case of the dual or the inverse uh, methods, since the matrix that we're approximating is in fact the inverse of B, we don't have to solve a linear system. We just need to do a matrix times vector product uh, with, with the matrix we're approximating. And then the big step or the, the uh, thing that we're we talked about in, in the next slides is what is this update for B? How do we make that approximation to B or to um, equivalently to H? And usually that's done by using the secant condition and then adding some regularization uh, to uh, determine what, what B needs to be. So in Broyden's method, for instance, we um, apply regularization that we are gonna compute B that is a, a minimum norm, minimus Frobenius norm. And again, that has a linear uh, system solve. We can do apply different types of regularization and these will give us different updates at this step. And this gives us other methods like David on Fletcher Powell and SR1 and Broyden symmetrized Powell and or Powell symmetrized Broyden and so forth. Um, similarly for the Dual methods, um, we have an update step and again, different regularization gives us different methods. Um, but the important thing to note again is that there's not a linear system solve. So this becomes a very cheap uh, method in some sense because we're just doing this matrix by vector product. 
Now, I kept saying there's no matrix. And here again, we have uh, a place where there's a matrix. So in the previous one, we had to solve a linear system based on a matrix. Here, we're saying we're doing a matrix by vector product. Um, again, we're going to uh, do this without actually forming the matrix, because again, we really just need to form the matrix times vector product in, in either case, right? So in, in the case where we have the inverse of the matrix, we just need to form the matrix vector product within the nonlinear algorithm. In the case where we need to do the linear solve, we can again use a Krylov solver and do the matrix vector product um, accordingly in, in the following way. So if we look at the um, update for uh, Broyden's direct method, for instance, it's equal to uh, the previous value of B plus uh, an outer product term. Well, we can re recurse back on what all of those terms are and just get a summation for what um, the matrix is. It's, it's the initial value B0 plus uh, the summation of outer product terms. Well, if we want to multiply um, that matrix B times some vector, we can do that by applying the, this outer product term, which now will just turn into a bunch of inner product terms uh, times the previously stored vectors. So this just becomes almost a, like a, a Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization step, but it, it is the, the amount of work isn't the size of the Hessian that isn't there, but rather is the um, based on the number of vectors we've stored for the outer product terms. Now there is the one term here, uh, this initial term of B0 times P that we need to compute. And again, we, we just need to compute the result of this. We don't need some initial actual Hessian. So um, it's typical to for instance, just use the identity as the initial value for B or some scale diagonal or something that's very, very quick to uh, compute with. And so again, we have Hessian based method without a Hessian. Now, what's really interesting is that, um, and this is something that's kind of work in progress and something we just kind of stumbled on, is that um, you can think about even higher order methods than Newton's method, so third or fourth order. Um, and you can create, um, the, the idea is that rather than trying to just compute the uh, slope, a straight line uh, to approximate the nonlinear function, we can try to fit a second order polynomial, we can try to fit a quadratic or a cubic. And if we do that, of course, you know, the terms we're trying to uh, compute might, you know, seem like third order. Well, that's suddenly the derivative of the Hessian, which the dimensionality blows up even more. And then the um, derivative of the um, derivative of the derivative of the derivative of the Hessian, that blows up even more. Well, it turns out uh, we can compute uh, you know, kind of following the theme we've been seeing, we can compute the effect of the third order term by uh, just adding a small correction term to the um, uh, uh, update uh, to D. So th this starts to have the actual kind of the feel of um, linear multi-step methods from o the ODE solution literature. And again, this is work in progress, but this is really interesting. and seems to, and we're hoping will solve some of the problems we, 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 or the community seems to run into sometimes with these second order methods. So um, implementation, I, I alluded to before that we um, can take advantage of uh, some of the structure of the problem and, and how the, when, when we're talking about computing the nonlinear function or the gradient, we're really talking about doing this forward and backward step uh, that we saw at the beginning with um, stochastic gradient descent. For the first implementation um, I did actually was just in my own, uh, just in C++. So this was just the Newton method. This is sort of line from line from the Newton method slide we had before. 
there's a Krylov solver step in the middle that uh, we can parallelize kind of at you know the node level um, and get the mini batch parallelism because again the in the step of doing uh, the matrix by vector product we um, are are just doing our forward and backward sweeps to uh, compute the gradient. Um, the, and, and this is something, I don't know if Hartman's on the line, but it would some, be something he, he would appreciate doing this in uh, the implementations in heavily parameterized C++. And so this is just written out pretty much like you would see the conjugate gradient algorithm in a textbook, in, including a um, matrix by vector product, but again, we can overload that to actually mean what we want it to mean, which in this case is this um, nonlinear function evaluation rather than an actual matrix times uh, vector product. And we can apply the same or, or did apply the same um, idea within um, the context of um, PyTorch. So there the, the basic training step looks like this. Um, this is actually the C++ um, interface to uh, PyTorch. So the, the training is just basically an outer loop going over batches of the data and then um, taking a, a step with the optimizer um, where we pass in this thing called a closure, which basically just the optimizer uses to do its gradient uh, computation. And so what we have in, um, or how this maps to our original, um, how, how the PyTorch maps to the original um, algorithm is, again, the um, place where we're doing what looks like this function evaluation here, f of x, is actually this gradient uh, computation. And then these different steps where we're doing vector operations, x equals x plus alpha p and so forth, are just tensor arithmetic that comes also with uh, PyTorch. And so the implementation in PyTorch looks much like, again, the pseudocode for the algorithm and also looks um, a lot like the other C++ implementation uh, we had before. So I'll skip, skip here quickly. We get to our results. So the, um, the final uh, thing I just want to show is um, how these have worked on kind of one of, one of the canonical machine learning problems, the uh, MNIST data set. Um, for those of you who haven't done MNIST um, problems yet, it's, um, the MNIST data set is 60,000 um, handwritten digits. Um, well, it's really two data sets. There's a training data set and a testing data set. So the training data set has 60,000 handwritten digits. And then the testing data set has 10,000 handwritten digits. And the goal is to train a network so that it can achieve the highest accuracy um, in terms of recognizing the digits in the testing set after having been trained by the digits in the training set. And so <clears throat> we applied um, the, uh, I'll, show, I'll show experiments for both the Krylov-Newton method as well as the um, quasi-Newton methods, the CCAM methods. But in applying the Newton-Krylov method our, in our first experiment, I was just measuring here um, the norm of the um, derivative of the cost function, the norm of the gradient um, as a function of iteration. And you can kind of see the, the Newton and the Krylov uh, performance here. So the, the plateaus that you see are basically every Newton step um, after which we have some Krylov iterations and those drive the, apparently the uh, solution low, but when we kick back out to the nonlinear solver, it's, it's not, we, we didn't actually make that much progress. So we pop back up to another plateau, but basically over time, the iteration uh, or the, gradient um, goes to zero, which seems like it would be good. Uh, except if we actually look at the norm of the uh, cost function itself, or equivalently, we could look at the accuracy. We find that after one step, we've gotten stuck. 
and don't make any more progress. And so, so what's happened here is we've gotten stuck in a local minimum. So in uh, the formulation of the second order problem, we just are looking for a place where the derivative goes to zero. We doesn't we necessarily guarantee that that's the optimal or even a great place. So in this case, we've gotten stuck at a, a not very good place. Um, so one important uh, open question really for second order methods is how to achieve good global convergence behavior. What I did in this case to try to fix that problem was used um, a few steps of stochastic gradient descent to initialize the second order method. So um, this graph shows three experiments of um, on, on MNIST. The blue line is um, just using stochastic gradient descent. And this is showing the accuracy of at, at each epoch of the uh, neural network at that time, the accuracy with the test set. So the um, stochastic gradient descent in blue, and you can kind of see that it you know, kind of converges, but just kind of jumps around. In orange is uh, the newton krylov method. And there I initialize it with, after one step of the uh, stochastic gradient descent. And so it converges, okay. Um, still kind of trying to catch up to uh, stochastic gradient descent. With the green line, I took five steps of um, stochastic gradient descent and use that to initialize the uh, second order method. And so there you can see that it starts off well and, and continues to stay above the um, stochastic gradient descent. What And, and so this is okay, right? Um, but what's remarkable is when we look at this, not as a function of epoch, but um, convergence as a function of time so here are the same data points, but I, again, plotted with as a function of elapsed time rather than, than epoch. And so here we can see that the second order methods are uh, much quicker um, in terms of elapsed time to converge than the first order method. And then finally, I can skip to the, the, the last slide for time. Um, we ran those same experiments adding um, some of the secant method uh, probe to. So the, the purple line is uh, using a secant method that's similar to the Broida method we looked at called um, SR1. And there it converged, um, you know, seems actually uh, uh, all of the methods here uh, seems to have the best uh, convergence as well as the most rapid uh, convergence. So this is just um, kind of scratching the surface of, I think, what can be done with these kind of methods. I mean, the stochastic gradient descent approaches have benefited from years and years and years of uh, polishing and tuning of the parameters and the methods and so forth. And the um, second order methods are just starting to gain attention, starting to get the same kind of tuning, but I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, both in, in terms of now really implementing some of these methods in um, problems that are, are much larger than MNIST. So MNIST is fine. It's kind of a always a, a sanity check on any new approach, but um, we're in the process now of trying to scale up to doing um, problems using CIFAR and using larger uh, networks like ResNet and so you, and then we also want to do that in the context of instead of this custom C++ and or even the C++ stuff in LibTorch, do it in in the mainstream uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow so that we can really do apples to apples kinds of comparisons uh, with state of the art gradient uh, approaches. And one of the uh, main goals, and, and this was one of the. Uh, <clears throat> main goals of our uh, proposal that uh, Dr. Bentley alluded to earlier. Uh, we want to really scale this up. And this was really the other um, side of these methods, not just that these have good convergence and um, have some better efficiency on, on one node, but that they also offer 
uh, better uh, scalability at a large scale. And so we want to also start looking at scaling and are in the process of really trying to look at how to scale these up using uh, some of the technologies at um, CCT, um, most notably HPX and um, Phylanx. And so with that, I think um, I'll uh, thank um, CCT and uh, Patrick and everyone again, and be happy to answer uh, any questions. Yep. Thanks, Andrew, for your excellent talk. And if anyone of the audience want to ask some questions, ask a question. I also have seen someone put something in the chat. I will read the question in the chat to Andrew so he can answer. And so, yeah, please ask a question. So, Intra is asking, how do recent first order methods such as Adam perform in terms of conversions compared to second order or higher order methods? Oh, well, so this is a good question. And this is why some of the experiment you know, experimenting we want to uh, do to really find out. There was a paper um, that just came out. I haven't had a ch chance to really read it or try to reproduce the results that did some of those comparisons. Um, you know, Adam and, and a lot of these other approaches, as I mentioned, are really trying, are, are, are these super sophisticated refinements on the first order methods. So I think ultimately that they might improve convergence and so forth, but they still have the same limitations in terms of parallelizability. So I think, um, you know, the, the I, th I think the second order methods will, you know, particularly once th they have the same level of polishing and tuning um, and specialist and optimization uh, by the community that first order methods have had, I think they'll be more than competitive with these. Um, and but more importantly, they'll they'll still offer the better um, cap better potential uh, for scalability. Okay, thanks for your answer. Do we have more questions from the audience? Please type it in the Q and A chat, or just use the raise your hand button so you can ask the question yourself. Okay, there's one more question in the chat. I will read it out. Is anybody using minimization method similar to the parallel tempering used for spin classes? Okay, I'm not familiar with that. Um, so the, these are sort of like with these Joanna, yeah, do you want to sure. speak up and explain a little bit more? Give me a second. I can allow to talk. Okay. We have one more question. I will read it out again. If I understand correctly from the benchmark, the benefits of second order methods are twofolded. First, faster computations per iterations. Second, faster convergence per iteration. Yeah. And with the caveat that you can get faster convergence per iteration into a bad place. <laughs> We, we saw that uh, in, in the in the very first set of very first slides of the experimental results. So there's, um, you know, there, I, I think there's also work to, that needs to be done. In, as I mentioned, in terms of getting um, better global convergence behavior for these algorithms, so that you don't get trapped in, in in local minima. 
Okay. I think. Oh, there's one more. He's asking, may I see some completation, complexity analysis on the computation cost? Well, I, I don't have a slide with that now. Um, the uh, I, I prefer to do this one offline because I have to actually think to give the answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't have a slide with that, but the um, the the main cost in any of these. So I, I alluded a, a couple of times to the fact that there's this step or and this was in that closure I showed um, in in the um, PyTorch example and so forth but there's a step where we're doing basically the nonlinear function evaluation or the gradient computation or whatever that's sort of the main cost is going forward and backward in the model um, and so a lot of the complexity kind of just back of the envelope complexity um, people tend to think about or, or I've been thinking about in, in these methods is, you know, how many of those uh, function evaluations do you have to do? And in that case, you know, there's in, in the stochastic gradient descent, there's essentially one of those for the whole batch, right, per epoch in um, the non, in these second order methods, there's one of those per iteration, um, either the Newton iteration or the, the each Krylov iteration. So, um, so that, that would be kind of the, the comparison of epochs, how many epochs in stochastic gradient descent versus how many um, total iterations of the nonlinear and linear iterations are you doing in, at least in the Newton Krylov iterations. It's not, well, I guess that's true even in, in the, the secant iterations. It's basically one, one function evaluation, one back and forth um, at, at each iteration. So, um, but that again is not quite apples and apples because the, um, again, a stochastic gradient descent, you have to do one sample or one mini batch after another, whereas in the second order methods, you can do the entire uh, batch at once in the forward and backward end scale that out or do that in parallel. So, yes, that's the best I can do with them off the top of my head for complexity. Okay, we have one last question. According to your numerical experiments among these quasi-Newton methods, which one experimentally works better? That's hard to say because I don't think there's been enough um, experimenting done with that yet. And my, the one that people use the most often is the um, LBFGS method. So it's the limited memory, Royden, Fletcher, Goldfarb, Shannon algorithm. Um, but I, I'm not convinced that that's necessarily the best. So I, I think the jury's still out on that question. Okay. Thanks again for your excellent talk. And thanks again to Dr. Bentley for his welcome remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you.